says all these summing junctions become nodes. And if you reverse the directions of the arrows, we leave the nodes, we enter these from the backward direction. We even reverse the direction of this arrow. So this one has one input and M outputs, one input and M outputs. So the dual of a resampling filter is the opposite of what that resampling filter originally did. If originally you're doing down sampling, the dual does up sampling. So if once you know how to build one, you know how to build the other. You know how to convert signals, processing block diagrams into their duals. And if you do a dual, an analysis filter becomes a synthesis filter. Neat little trick. So that saves us half the work. Why would you want to use a multi-ray filter in the first place? So Dilbert comes to our rescue and says, let me show you why. So here's Dilbert. Now, this is a standard processing task. We have an analog system, which is a receiver, which will solve this problem for us. The input signal is a bunch of narrow band signals distributed approximately equally spaced across the frequency domain. We pick one of those spectral centers. And what we want to do is have this receiver give us the digital envelope in the time domain of a signal centered at this frequency. We know how to do that. We were doing it long time before the DSP came along. We could build analog-based receivers. I made this presentation many, many years ago at a Signal Process Society meeting at Brigham Young University. And Michael Rice was my host and invited me to do this presentation. When I put this slide up, everyone in the audience applauded. And I couldn't figure what was worth applauding. And I asked. I said, why are you fellows and gals applauding? And he said, we are tickled pink that the channel you chose to demodulate was shaped like the state of Utah, the state in which is hosting your talk. If my life had depended upon it, I don't think I could have told you what the state of Utah looked like. But subsequently, I have learned what the state of Utah looks like, just like the picture that I chose to demodulate in the previous slide. Okay, something you know, we often have an existing analog solution and we want to insert DSP for reasons we'll see in a moment. So here's advice. I've had people come back to me after many years of being out of school saying this is the best piece of advice I ever gave. If you want to replace an analog system with your equivalent digital system, the instinctive first response would be, copy all the things in the analog system and make digital counterparts of them, glue all the digital counterparts together the way the analog parts were, and voila, you have a digital version of the analog prototype. Don't do that. Avoid doing this because it's not a productive thing to do. If you don't uh, avoid this, then you're copying an analog design. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to replace an analog design with a digital design which has certain improvements. We don't want to invoke a, um, let's see, we invoke DSP to improve the performance and reduce the cost. The analog systems were built at a time that they didn't have as many capabilities as we now currently have. So certain compromises were made. And when those compromises were made, they are existing in the analog prototype. If we copy the analog prototype, we perpetuate those compromises. Don't do that. What you want to do is use the new tools and resources we have available that were not available to past designers, and you're going to beat the pants out of the designs performed by the old analog designers. Not that they're old designers, it's an old design because it happened many years ago. Okay. Let's look at what a first generation DSP receiver would look like. It says block diagram on the bottom. And you can see at the input to the system, we have our spectrum of the signal presented to our port. We know where the signal of interest is that we're supposed to process. So the first thing we do is we move that signal to baseband. It's called a down conversion. Since the signal is asymmetric, it means it must be complex. And if it's complex, it has both an in-phase and a quadrature component. So now there are two ports coming out of this lead. 
we go into a pair of low pass filters, which limit the bandwidth. And now that we've limited the bandwidth, we can now sample the data at a rate which satisfies Nyquist. The rate that satisfies Nyquist means the distance between the copies is bigger than the width of the copies you're trying to replicate. As long as the spacing is bigger, there must be a gap. If there's a gap, we satisfy Nyquist. We can reconstruct the original analog signal from the digital samples, providing we can extract one of this spectrum from the periodic spectrum that we now have available. We want to go to DSP land. So we take the input signal with a distributed wide bandwidth, and we first limit its bandwidth. You must go through an anti-aliasing filter to limit its bandwidth. Then we sample at a rate, which is wider than the two-sided spectrum. And when we do that, we now have this spectrum periodically replicated at all multiples of the sampler rate all multiples of the sample age, right? Let's remember that. Now we do DSP-based processing. So we deliver this signal spectrum to our DSP-based system, and we're going to do something we shouldn't do. We're going to copy the analog prototype. We know where the signal is, so we heterodyne it to baseband. Ta -da. This is digital frequency in radians per sample. Digital frequency in radians per sample say the signal is going tick, 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 tick like the hands on a clock and we can make bigger steps around the clock or smaller steps if they're small steps then the frequency is a small fraction of the sampler rate if they're big steps as you walk around the circle then the frequency is a significant fraction of the sampler rate okay now that we have heterodyned the signal to baseband again two heterodynes one with cosine one with sine we go through a pair of filters and the filters now isolate our signal. Doing this in digital land has a certain number of attractive uh, of attributes. And one of them is that the in phase and quadrature components in digital land are perfectly matched. I guarantee the in phase and quadrature paths in the analog world are not properly matched. Properly matched means exactly matched, which means when you have IQ and balance, two un unpalatable things happen. The first thing is I and Q are no longer orthogonal. Oh dear. They're supposed to be orthogonal. We learn that's why we use them. The other terrible thing is positive and negative frequencies are no longer orthogonal. Every positive frequency talks to his negative frequency image. And an OFDM, two signals at frequency plus and minus K around zero are discussing what's going on in your house while they're doing what they're supposed to be doing in their own house. So the advantage of doing IQ processing in digital land removes that uh, degradation of performance due to lack of orthogonality. The other thing is in the analog world, our low pass filters are recursive filters. Recursive filters have bad group delay, particularly as you approach the bandage. And as you approach the bandage, the group delay becomes cumbersome and will badly corrupt the spectrum near the band edge of the filter. In the digital world, we can build linear phase filters which don't give us that corruption. So we're going to build much, much better systems in the DSP land than we would have built in analog land, even if we copy the analog solutions, which we shouldn't be doing in the first place. Once we've reduced the bandwidth, we're now free to reduce the sample rate. You must do that if you want your company to stay in business. Now, this ignores good advice. What's the good advice? Don't copy the analog system. Now, this is what we just did. This is the system sometimes called the Armstrong heterodyne, which says a signal arise, we heterodyne the signal of interest to baseband. We reduce its bandwidth. And once we reduce the bandwidth, we reduce the sample rate. Those are the three building blocks. Those three building blocks are going to be in everything we do. Choose the center frequency, move the spectrum of interest to where the filter is, do the filtering. Once you reduce the bandwidth, reduce the sampler rate. Now, this is the picture we just drew. Signal of interest, a filter, what do we do? We move the signal of interest to where the filter is. We do the signal processing, reduce the bandwidth, reduce the sampler rate. Duck soup. 
Now, this is what we had to face when we started building radios 100 years ago. We have a signal at a known center frequency and a filter which is not aligned with that center frequency. Armstrong came along and said, hey guys, we know how to fix this problem. If the signal isn't where the filter is, move the signal to where the filter is. It's called a heterodyne. Hetero means different, dyne means move. The heterodyne means move signal to filter. That was the second way we started building radios. Before Armstrong came along, we had a different way of building radios. If the filter isn't where the signal is, move the filter to where the signal is. And that was called a tuned RF receiver, TRF. And what a TRF did, it took the tuned circuit of the filter and adjusted inductors or capacitors by mechanically moving a physical piece of hardware to retune the circuit to be at another center frequency. We didn't like to do that, so we stopped doing it. And we said, let's leave all the filters where they are. And it's more easily done to move the signal to where the filter is. In the modern era, that may not be true. Because in the digital world, a filter is simply a bunch of numbers in memory. So if I had a low pass filter and I want to convert it to a band pass filter, what do I do? I take the numbers out of memory, multiply by sines and cosines and put them back in memory. Filter doesn't know the coefficients of change. The filter doesn't know is now a band pass filter instead of a low pass filter. And if you heterodyne the filter, you can turn off the sine cosine generators, which must run continuously if you're heterodyning the signal to where the filter is. You get less work if you embed the heterodyne in the filter, because you don't have to keep on applying it to the data as the data goes into the system. Neat little trick. So this is what we just did. We took the low pass filter and heterodyned it up to where the carrier of interest was. Now that heterodyne was a complex heterodyne. And a complex heterodyne means it's not, it does not have a symmetric spectrum. It's no longer um, uh, symmetric that the, all symmetries say that a real signal must always have Hermitian symmetry in its spectrum. A complex signal and a complex filter no longer have to be Hermitian symmetric. That means in the digital land, I'll say that again, in the digital land, there is no image frequency, which will interfere with the signals in the spectral interval, which are the negative frequency image of the positive frequency upon which you're standing. That means there's no possibility of two signals aliasing to the same location if you change the location of that spectral position. So what we do, we've reduced the bandwidth, that's what we did here. We reduce the bandwidth while it's on the IF strip. Then what we do is we lower the sample rate. Why can we lower the sample rate? Because as long as the sample rate exceeds the two-sided bandwidth, you're allowed to lower the sample rate. So we do it. When we lower the sample rate, we lose the center frequency. In fact, the center frequency aliases to a new location. That location may be zero, but if it's not, we say, oh darn, I didn't get all the way to zero. We'll now heterodyne the system from the offset from zero and put it exactly at zero. But now the heterodyne is the last thing we did instead of the first thing we did. And the heterodyne occurs at the low sample rate instead of the high input sample rate. For instance, suppose this guy was sitting exactly 300 kilohertz and we lowered the sample rate to 100K. Well, a trip around the circle is 100K. The second trip is another 100K. And the third trip is another 100K. So 300K is identical to zero. Ta-da! But what if he was at 310? If he's 310 and we lower the sample rate to 100K, the first trip goes around, the second trip goes around, 300 still goes to zero. Where does 310 go? It goes 10 away from zero. What do you do? You nudge in the way home with an output heterodyne at the low output sample rate. Neat. This is the first time we've seen the idea of alias in a signal from one location to another. We now call it IF sampling in the modern era, but it's stronger than IF sampling. It's a very powerful concept, and we want to see what that is. This is what we just did. We put the rotator 
in the bandpass filter. We took the signal, we took the filter and heterodyned it up to the center frequency. The signal that came out of the filter is reduced bandwidth, but now still at the same center frequency. So what do we do? We heterodyne into baseband. Once we heterodyne into baseband, we're allowed to lower the sampler rate. Gee, that's strange. What if I interchange these? I'll come back in a minute. So what we just described is something called the equivalency theorem. It says, here's the signal which we down convert to baseband and go through a low pass filter. So we know how to do convolution. We do a summation on a dummy index where the dummy index tells me how much offset there is relative to current time, current time being the output. And we do an inner product with the weights of the filter. Now you notice the heterodyne has an exponential and I can take out the e to the j theta n. So he leaves the sum, he's no longer involved in the sum. What's left is now e to the plus j theta k. Well, only thing that runs on k is the data, is the filter. So now we associate the rotators with the filter. What we just did is we upconverted the filter, went through the filtering operation with the upconverted filter. And when we left the filter, we then downconverted to baseband. So this heterodyne and that heterodyne are the same. And this is called the equivalency theorem. I learned this as a graduate student more than 50 years ago when I was a graduate student at UCSD. I took a class from Erwin Jacobs. Now, the building in which I work is called the Jacobs Building. And occasionally I see Erwin walking around the hall. And one day I saw him in the lobby in the front door. And he said, Erwin, what are you doing here? And I thought to myself, you don't tell the person who owns the building, what are you doing here? Say, oh, Erwin, I'm glad to see you in your building. So I had to apologize for that question. Okay, so this is what the equivalency theorem says. I can go through an IQ converter and then through a filter, or I can go through a filter which contains the IQ converter, up converting, and then I can down convert when I leave the filter. This wouldn't make sense in the analog world because here there are two multiplies, now there are four multiplies but it makes sense in the sample data world. Because what I can now do is this. It's foolish to down convert samples I know that are going to be thrown away. What I'll do, I'll cross the street with the down converter and say, hey, I only down convert the ones you keep. So we do this. We lower the sampler rate here and we lower the sampler rate. This signal alias to new frequency. Not, that the, not only did the signal alias to new frequency, but the down converting oscillator also converted to new frequency. When it was on this side of the switch, this guy was rotating at theta radians per sample and tick, 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 let's say it's five degrees per sample. Let's say I did uh, 32 to one down sampling or 36 to one down sampling. Well, 36 times five is 180, is that right? Yeah, it is. So now we're rotating 180 degrees per sample. He knows it and he knows it. But suppose I did, if they were rotating five degrees per sample, 72 to one down sampling. If I did 72 to one down sampling, M times theta, five times 72, works out to be 360 degrees per sample. Well, 360 degrees per sample meant it didn't change. And if it didn't change, I'm always multiplying by the same number, which is always the number one. Why am I wasting my time doing that? So the next term that we have in this operation is, oh, here we had, we rotated down to baseband and heterodyned if we had to, but we don't have to heterodyne because we can do this. This is our old Armstrong, Armstrong down converter. We apply the equivalency theorem, which said, let's put the rotator in back instead of in front. And then common sense says, why should we, down convert numbers we knew we were bound to discard, will work the down converter at the output sampler rate. Now, when we use the converter at the down sampled rate, the rotation rate is no longer theta radians per sample, but m times theta. Wouldn't it be neat if m times theta were congruent to two pi? That's a strange word, congruent to two pi. It means it's a multiple of two pi. Well, if m times theta is a multiple of two pi, then theta must be a multiple of two pi over m. Theta must be a multiple of the output sample rate. 
if the input center frequency was a multiple of the output sampler rate, when you lower the sampler rate m to one, then your signal has alias to baseband. And if it's alias to baseband, this number that I'm multiplying by is always the number one. Why should you waste your time multiplying by number one? We can build a receiver that doesn't have a heterodyne on the input and doesn't have a heterodyne on the output. We move the signal from where it was to where we wanted it to be by simply changing the sampler rate. That's pretty neat stuff. Now, the problem is we've gotten rid of one problem. We've gotten rid of the heterodyne, but now we have another problem. Just because a sample arrived doesn't mean we should compute it. Why not? Because that sample may be destined to be thrown away. Oh, dear. So that would be foolish to compute it and have this guy throw it away. Data arrives, I compute it, and he throws it away. Data arrives, I compute it, and he says, ah, that's the one I want. If that's the one he wanted, that's the one you should have built. So now we want to include the resampler in the filtering operation and do the resampling while we're doing the filtering. Now, suppose I have a filter, which I know is destined to have a three to one down sampler in it. If the filter is going to see a three to one down sampler, the surprise is you can put the three to one down sampler in the filter and the filter will both do the filtering and the down sampling simultaneously. Now, how do you build a three to one down sampler in the filter? You build a three path filter. If I'm gonna do 10 to one down sampling, you build a 10 path filter. If I'm gonna do M to one down sampling, you build M paths. What do these paths do? They go back to the original prototype and say, all right, path number zero starts at index zero and counts by three. Path number one starts at index one and counts by three. Path number two starts at index two and counts by three. Now you've got zeros all over the place. The three zeros in front, this one, and these two are delays between the input to where the filter starts really seeing data. We're gonna remove these delays. One delay for path one, two delays for path two. These are the phase shift responsible for phase shift because we know that's what happens when you time delay a system, you introduce phase shift as a function of frequency. These guys are deadly important. The ones in between are called interstitial zeros. The interstitial zeros mean nothing. For instance, if I have data two zeros, data two zeros, data two zeros, all it means is I have three copies of the spectrum. When you have interstitial zeros, it's called zero packing. The spectrum is the same of the original data without these zeros, but now you have three copies of it. Why should you process a signal that has three copies? If you get rid of the zeros, you have one copy. If you have one copy, you have less bandwidth and there's no need to process the other two copies. If you need the spectrum at the other two copies, borrow my copy, I'll lend you the one I have by processing the, processing the data without the zeros. And the trick that allows me to throw the interstitial zeros is known as a noble identity. So we have two things going on here, the delays in front, which are important, and the delays inside, which are so trivial, we can throw them away, and we will. We have to extract these, and these will discard. Incidentally, this mapping of moving data into rows, but processing by columns, is known as the, let's see, what's it called? It's called the, oh, goodness. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's the same processing that we use in the Cooley Tiki transform. It's called um, um, uh, processing in natural order. You load data in rows and you process by columns. You load data in rows and you process by columns. So the Cooley Tiki transform and its reduction in workload is inherited by the polyphase filter bank because it does the same trick that's a Cooley Tukey transform does. Lexicographic mapping is what it's called. When you load data in natural order, you load in one order, but process in the other order. Okay. So this is the MPATH version of what we just did. Here's our polyphase. This is our one dimensional filter destined to be followed by an M to one down sampler. 
we want to include that m to one down sampler so we build polynomials of z to the m that's going to be important so we write this one dimensional filter as a two dimensional filter so you start on row zero and row zero says i want to take all the coefficients starting index zero and counting by m Ta-da! and I go to row number one r stands for row when I go to row number one, there's a delay to get to that first uh, sample. And then you start at address one and count by M. Go to row number two, two delays, start at address two and count by M. You get to the last one, M minus one delays, start at M minus one and count by M. That's it. So this is a extension of what we did for three paths. We can do it for M paths. No penalty at all. Now, what we don't want to do it for a low pass filter, we want to do it for a band pass filter. We want to see what happens. Remember, putting the rotators in the filter made them go away, sort of. So what we do with the modulation theorem, we spin the coefficients of the filter. That converts our low pass filter to a band pass filter. But we notice that the index on the rotator and the index on the delay are the same. So what we could do is rotate the delays instead of rotate the coefficients. And that's exactly what we do. If we put the rotators on the delay, it's called the modulation theorem. So we take the original polynomial, rotate the delays, and we now have a bandpass polynomial. So here's the two-dimensional mapping. We start at index R and count by M. We have the rotators that start at index R and count by M. We have the delays that start on the index R and count by M. The E to the J theta R and the Z to the minus R can be factored out. And they go between the two sums. So now this is a sum which only has the delays which are delays which are multiples of M. And these are the delays which are multiples of R, which row are you standing on? Now, we're going to invoke our magic relationship. We like the rotators, these angles, to be a multiple of 2 pi over m. If the rotators are a multiple of 2 pi over m, then m times that angle, m times that angle is a multiple of 2 pi. If it's a multiple of 2 pi, this disappears. I'll be darned. We took, we went through a lot of trouble to put the rotators in the filter so we could ignore them. And when we put them in the filter, they vanish. Isn't that amazing? but they leave behind a footprint. And the footprint is a rotator attached to each delay. Why delay? Delay is phase shift. What does the rotator do? He's undoing the phase shift caused by the delay. And that's what our polyphase filter is. We now know what a polyphase filter is. We're now gonna show you how to use them. Ta-da! So this is the block diagram we just generated. We know we're gonna do M to one down sampler build polynomials of M. When we did that, the rotators that were in the filter were taken out, leaving behind the footprint, which only depends upon the index R. This is row one, row two, row three, row M minus one, M minus two. K times R is the rotator. Now we'd like to do something about the resampling. It works out M units of delay at the input clock rate. Tick, 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 bang. Tick, 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 bang. Is the same delay as one unit of delay at the output clock rate. Isn't that amazing? So instead of running my delays with M samples between them at the input clock rate, I can run the delay with one sample between them at the output clock rate. And nothing is different. Noble identity, a term coined by P.V. Vaidanathan at Caltech. So if I have a delay line with M minus, with M to one delay, I can put the delay line in front and replace it with one delay in back. And input to output, these are indistinguishable. And if it's true for a delay, it's true for any polynomial that uses those delays. So my polynomial in Z to the minus M running at the input rate is now a polynomial in Z to the minus one running at the output rate. So we just drag that resample through the filters. And we can get them all the way till we hit these delays. We can't go through there because we only go through multiples of Z to the M. So these delays stay and they're separated from our filtering, which now all the filtering in our engine occur at the low output rate instead of the high input rate. 
we're almost home free. Suppose we bring real data in, and real data hits this rotator. What does it do? It becomes complex. If it becomes complex, now we have two paths in the filter, one for I and one for Q. Gee, but this is a scalar. Scalars commute with filtering operations. I can move that rotator to the output without changing the results. So we just did that. Now, if real data comes in, it stays real inside the filter. We no longer have an IQ in the filter. We only have an I in the filter. The data became complex as we left the filter instead of on the way into the filter. Pretty neat little trick. We're almost finished. And now what we're going to do is say, what's going to happen when this switch closes? Well, the current sample gets delivered. What happens when this switch closes? They, they close in concert. Well, the output of this delay line goes into here. What is the output of the delay line? That's an input that was available one sample ago. When this switch closes, E gets thrown into the filter. What is he throwing in? The input that occurred two, day, two samples ago. Why should we hold these samples in these temporary registers and wait till the last guy arrives? We can throw them in as soon as they arrive. They're gonna to get to this guy anyway. You may as well let him start working as the input samples arrive. So I can replace all these all these uh, uh, down samplers running with no delay, one delay, two delay, three, with a device called the commutator. And the commutator delivers samples where they're going to go eventually. If they're going to get there eventually, I'll let them go in as they arrive. That's it. This is our polyphase filter bank. What good is it? Oh, incidentally, this is now called a linear time. It's no longer a linear time invariant filter. As soon as I brought the resampler to the input of the filters, this filter has now different impulse responses depending where it's pointing when the input sample impulse arrives. When the impulse arrives, when I'm here, this is the impulse response of the filter. If the impulse arrived when the pointer is here, it's got a different impulse response. If the input arrives when the sample pointer is here, it's got another impulse re response. It, because it has different impulse responses, it has a nasty property. The property is this. A signal of two different frequencies can appear at the same output frequency in this filter. That means it no longer has causality. I can tell you by looking at the output what the input was because I can give you M different input frequencies, which give me the same output signal at the output port. Oh dear. That means it doesn't have a transfer function. If it doesn't have a transfer function, all the tools of analysis and synthesis are wiped off the board. You now have to start thinking a different way about multi-rate signal processing. All your tools are now no longer available. So we'll learn what those new tools are. So what did we learn? We said Armstrong taught us how to do this. The equivalency theorem said we can put the rotators inside where we never have to see them. And when we include the, uh, the noble identity and the sliding of the resampler through the filter, we have the most amazing thing. Instead of having the resampling occur at the output, the resampling occurs at the input. Instead of selecting what frequency we want at the input, we select what frequency we want at the output. Now that's amazing. So what we've done, we've totally turned everything we learned about signal processing on its ear. We're gonna run backwards. Instead of running, select the signal, do the processing at the high rate, now lower the sample rate. We convert it to, let's lower the sample rate. We alias all the bands to baseband. And then we'll select which alias we want by picking which set of rotators here. These rotators are phase aligned with the spinning aliases that we will observe in every M path of the M path filter. Ta-da. Okay. So what we do is these select an alias from all the aliases that occur because we lowered the sample right up in front. And Dilbert think that's pretty neat. Okay, funny story. Many, many years ago, uh, probably about 1985, I, uh, 1983, there it is. I designed the 65,000 channelizer for General Telephone and Electric up in San Jose. 
and my design aliased all 65,000 channels to baseband. And we submitted our design to the Navy, who was building a basically a big surveillance receiver. And I thought we were going to become famous. We were changing how people solve problems. And GTE was certainly going to get the award because that was the cleverest design the reviewers would have seen. The proposal was sent back to us a week later with big red letters, red letters across the face of the proposal saying, those who don't understand the Nyquist theorem shouldn't be doing signal processing. I wish I had saved that cover. I would have framed it and hung it on the wall. What I learned is if you're smarter than your reviewer, you're both in trouble because they don't know what you're talking about and they're going to give you a bad review. And if they don't know what you're talking about, you have to educate them as part of the review process. You just had the review process. See, these are all these spectra which are sitting on the frequency domain. Each of these spectra is spinning at a given rate. If this guy is at F naught, he's spinning at a rate which is F naught times uh, divided by FS times two pi. This guy's spinning twice as fast because he's at twice the frequency. He's spinning three times as fast. He's three times the frequency. Every one of them is spinning at a rate which happens to be the M roots of unity in an M path filter. Now, when I add up, when these guys alias the baseband, they all go back to baseband with their known phase angle. And that means if I add up all the signals at this frequency, where they're now all residing due to aliasing, only the one that's not rotating survives. That's why you could do the down sampling. And since he wasn't rotating, he would survive the sum. These guys are rotating. Let's say he's rotating 10 degrees per sample in a 36 uh, path filter, zero, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees. But I add up 36 of these guys, they are the roots of unity. And we know the roots of unity sum to zero. They destructively cancel at the summing junction. If I wanted to make this one not cancel, what you do is you de-spin them, move them back 10 degrees, move them back 20 degrees, move them back 30. In doing that, he had zero, 10, 20, 30. So the one you de-spin is the only one that survives the sum. That's such a neat little trick. So here's the example. All these guys have alias the baseband. So all these bands are sitting here and every one of these paths has a different set of aliases. They're all alias at the same frequency, but they all have a different phase angle. Notice our, uh, I, uh, our Matt, um, what is this? It was, uh, what did I say? It was Utah. Utah at this uh, ba uh, branch and Utah in this branch and Utah in this branch is different, but I know the rate of spin, so I de-spin them. When I de-spin them, that's the only guy surviving the sum. Everyone else is still spinning and they don't survive the sum. That little summing junction destructively cancels the aliases. The fact that you can destructively cancel all the aliases except one, and it doesn't matter which one you select, whichever rate of rotation you select here, that's the only one that survives. And since I can extract any of them, it means I can extract all of them. That's amazing. This filter can now extract all the filter, all the signals of interest with one filter, allowing all the terms to go to baseband and only the phase rotators after the terms do the extraction of the channel of interest. Now, here's an example. I built an Armstrong receiver and I picked out the channel of interest. And I use a polyphase filter to pick out the channel of interest at the end. And notice when I did the down sampling, all I have is an in phase and not a, quad, not a quadrature. When I did the assignment to the complex data up in front, I have an in phase and a quadrature filter. So already I've saved half the filtering by putting the rotators in back instead of putting the rotators in front. But what if I have two channels? Someone says, gee, I'd like like you to get Utah. Let's get St. Lo St. Louis also. St. Louis was a, 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 a parabola. Well, that means I've got to build a whole another receiver. Two more filters, one for I and Q for this channel, one for I and Q in this channel. What does the polyphase filter do? It says, well, 
The only thing different between my channel and your channel are the rotators. So I'll have to alias all the guys to baseband and use a different set of rotators to get your channel out. I still only have one filter here, and here I've got four filters. And the more filters you want, the more dramatic this becomes. If I wanted 20 channels, I need 20 filters times two. If I want 20 channels, I get 20 set of rotators. Only get one filter. A magic. Now, since all these rotators look familiar, these rotators happen to be the rotators of an inverse Fourier transform. So I can build a bank of rotators following these paths. And if I use this channel, that's the one that uh, with only a direct sum. That's the channel of DC. If I get this channel, this is the one that's rotating e to the j 2 pi over m. If I use this channel, it's the one rotating twice 2 pi over m. If I use this one, it's rotating three times 2 pi over m. So the FFT, when you build this, not a supposed to be an IFFT typo, the FFT reduces the cost of the rotator such as such, such a small number, it becomes insignificant. And the filtering similarly becomes insignificant. This guy is remarkably efficient. Incidentally, why would you want a polyphase filter? There must be some advantage. And I found a cartoon about things which you have advantage. If you're a cartoon character, you have an advantage. You can do things that the other cars can't do. And that's what happens here. In a polyphase filter, you can do things that the other guys can't do. Okay. Now, something about samplery. If you build a filter, the length of the filter is an important measure of the performance of the filter. The length of the filter, I'm not going to do the derivation, I'll just make the statement, is not driven by the bandwidth, it's not driven by the sample rate, it's only driven by the ratio between sample rate and transition bandwidth. That is, if I have a filter with a given transition bandwidth and a fixed sample rate, and I made the filter wider, and I made it much wider, for the same transition bandwidth and the same sample rate and the same out-of-band attenuation, these filters will all be the same length. The bandwidth has nothing to do with the length of the filter. The rule of thumb, sample rate divided by delta F, attenuation in dB divided by 20. That's approximately the right answer. It's a little bit of refinement, but that's all you need. Now, that says, if I want to build a filter at the lowest workload, I want the smallest filter. Well, if you want the slowest filter and you're not allowed to re reduce the transition bandwidth, you need that to satisfy a spec. You're not allowed to reduce the amount of attenuation. You need that to satisfy the spec. The only knob you can turn to make the cost less expensive is change the sample rate. You can't change the transition. You can't change the attenuation. If you want to change the length of the filter, change the sample rate. That's why we're doing this. So what's the lowest sample rate you can get? The lowest sample rate is the one that satisfies Nyquist. What did Nyquist tell us? Nyquist said, the sample rate must exceed the two-sided bandwidth. Always talk about two-sided bandwidth. By how much should exceed the two-sided bandwidth? See, Nyquist didn't give us a spec. Nyquist gave us a constraint. You must now convert the constraint into a spec, and the spec says the sample rate must be greater than the bandwidth by the transition bandwidth. And this becomes an equal sign. When the sample rate is the bandwidth plus the transition bandwidth, two-sided bandwidth plus transition, you cannot lower the sample rate any lower than that because then you violate Nyquist. So what is the two-sided bandwidth here? I have a 40K bandwidth and a 40K transition. That says the lowest bandwidth I can get away, lowest sample rate is 80K. If I can lower the sample rate to 80K, 80K versus uh, four meg, that's a 50 to one ratio. So I can build a 400 tap filter if I design this filter at the low sample rate. Not bad at all. I can't design the filter at the high sample rate because that would give me 50 times longer. That would be a terribly long filter. So I'm going to lower the sample rate and design the filter for the low sample rate. Ta-da! How do we do that? Well, you lower the sample rate. That's your polyphase filter. You design the filter at the low sample rate and then include the resampler as part of the filter. That was, means instead of doing the downsampling on the output, 
to do the downsampling on the input. So what we have here is I took 400 weights and put them in 50 paths. How much data is in each path? It works out to be 400 divided by 50. I do eight multiplies and adds here, put it in the accumulator. Eight multiplies and adds here, put it in the accumulator. And I will have done two things simultaneously, lowered the sample rate, lowered the bandwidth, and I did it with only eight operations per input. So remember, we're only using these legs one at a time. You don't need 50 legs waiting there. You build one eight tab filter and have eight 50 sets of coefficients. And I call this a Gatling gun model. And the Gatling gun model says deliver an input. There it is. Deliver a set of weights to run that filter. Deliver the next input. Deliver a different set of weights to run that filter. Deliver the next input. Build a different set of weights. The Gatling gun allows me to deliver eight coefficients at a time to each of the 50 filters, only one at a time exists. And each time I get an output, we dump the results into a, it's called a partial sum accumulator. When all 50 have arrived, you clear the accumulator to start delivering new input and you now have the output. I did this once many years ago for a surveillance receiver we designed for Cubic Corporation. And when we designed it, the chief engineer said, Fred, had you stayed awake at the design review meeting, you would have remembered that you're not allowed to change the sample rate of your filter because I need the original sample rate for some post detection operations. I said, oh, no problem. If you need your high sample rate, I'll give you back your high sample rate by building a dual graph. See, that's why I mentioned what the dual graph was. I'll use this filter, which cost me eight operations per input. For every input, I only do eight operations. And I give you the downsampled filter version. Do you want your sample rate back? So I'll build a dual graph. And for every sample I generate, I will give you 50 outputs. So data goes in at a four megahertz rate, eight multiplies and adds per input. Data comes out at a four megahertz rate, eight operations per output. This combination, if I put it in a box, say, look, data goes in at four meg, comes out at four meg. That's a perfectly good filter. The original filter cost me 400 operations per input output. It's now costing me 16 operations per input output. If you can't get an order of magnitude reduction in work, it means you fell asleep at the switch. Almost every filter I ever designed using these polyphase designs gives you at least an order of magnitude reduction in work. Okay, so the original 400 tab filter, input rate, output rate the same, 400 multiplies and adds for input output. Eight tab filter, data comes in at 400. In between is 80K, we convert it back to four meg. Gatling gun on this side, Gatling gun on this side. We roll four a new set of coefficients in. Every time an input arrives, we knew we slide a new set of coefficients every time an output arrives or it leaves. Eight operations per input, eight operations per output. Not bad, a 25 to one saving. If I only had little white boxes with inputs and outputs, and all you could see was the input and output and a voltmeter or a scope, seeing what the input and outputs look like, how do you know what's inside the boxes? Which was running full bore which is a running mildly at a low data rate. It's called the wet finger test. In the wet finger test, you touch this guy. If he's hot, you say, ouch, that's hot. That's probably a guy running full bore. On the other hand, if I touch this one, ooh, how gently cool that is. That's nice and comfortable. Now I know which is the one running and converting less energy into smoke. Okay, they actually do exactly that. Now. Here's a little comment we make. The one we looked at before, I had a 40K transition bandwidth and a 40K uh, analysis bandwidth. And we found we could do that with a 400 tap filter. And we built it. And someone says, I'm gonna make the transition one tenth of what it was. Instead of 40K, it's gonna be 4K. As soon as I make the transition smaller by a factor of 10, the filter gets bigger by a factor of 10. Now it's a 4,000 tap filter. What can you do then? What you do, you say, don't, don't sweat. Use the first filter to lower the sample rate 
50 to 1. Once you lower the filter sample rate 50 to 1, then you build the filter which will meet the specs. I'm going to design this narrow band filter with a little bitty transition bandwidth at the low sampler rate. Now, these words will be prophetic. Remember what I just said, I'm about to say. I lowered the sampler rate 50 to 1. That lowers the number of taps in the filter, 50 to 1. So instead of having 4,000, 4,000 divided by 50 is only 80 taps. Oh, that's interesting. Now, not only is the filter shorter by 50 to 1, the clock is running at 150 to the speed. So we got a double return on investment. The filter is 150th of its length, running at 150th of its speed, we just reduced the workload a factor of 50 squared. In fact, that workload is so small, you can ignore it. And the only thing that's going to count in this system is I know it's going to cost me eight operations for input, eight operations per output, and it's going to cost me 80 operations inside, but those 80 operations are running at 150 of the workload. That means this increases the workload by another 1.6, 80 divided by 50. So it went from 16 to 18 operations to build a 4,000 tab filter because I made two problems out of it. First problem is lower the sample rate and then build your filter. And then I'll give you back your sample rate again as I would have before. And the inside workload is so small, you can almost ignore it. It's infinitesimal. Almost all the work goes into the down sampling and up sampling. And we know how to do that wonderfully well. And that's what we're going to do from now on. Okay, this is our filter. We know what it looks like. There are three things that happen. The filter contains a Fourier transform. And what does the Fourier transform tell you? He tells you with the space in between the output channels. Remember the channels of space at F sub S over M apart. You change the spacing by changing M. Great little trick. Then it has a variable bandwidth filter. The filter bandwidth is determined not by the transform, but by the weights of the filter. I can make the filter narrower. I can make it much narrower. I can make it wider or much wider by designing him to any bandwidth I want. Neat little trick. And then I detect, I determine the output sample rate. When I determine the output sample rate, it didn't come from the transform. It didn't come from the filter. It came from the commutator. This says deliver M inputs and I get output rate at one nth of the input rate. Oh, but I could have started this not at the bottom, but at the middle. I could deliver M over two inputs and get an output. That means I would have gotten the M over two down sampling when I run this filter which with a non maximally decimated form. And since these three are independent of each other, they are designed with each other's information in mind. You don't want to violate like Nyquist. When you raise the bandwidth, you should raise the sample rate. So I can do all three of these things independently. And I was once asked to do, oh, let's see. I had a customer once ask me to do that. I'll come back to that later. When you build filters, you can arrange for the filters to be at the center frequencies of the Fourier transform. Or you can arrange them to be midway between the center frequencies. These center frequencies are F sub M apart. Here, they're F sub, F sub S over M apart, but they start at F S over M divided by two apart. So these are called the even index Fourier transform bins, and these are called the odd index Fourier transform bins. You can build a channelizer with either one of these present. See, if you build them with a bin centered at zero, you've got DC in the center of one of your bins. DC is not a nice guy as far as the analog world is concerned. That's why OFDM doesn't put anything at DC because you're going to get intrusion from the analog world into the DC bin. Darn. So what we often do is we shift all the bins sideways so DC is now between two channels instead of the middle of channel and you don't waste a channel. So this is why we might be interested in having the bins at the odd multiples of F sub M over two instead of the even intervals of F sub S over M. Ta-da! 
that too can be folded into the channelizer. That's something new. We didn't know that in the, until the recent past. So here's an example. Now, this is an impossibly good set of specs. When you're given an impossibly good set of specs, impossibly good means big sampler rate, narrow band transition. So here's a channel, 24 megahertz apart. The transition bandwidth is only half a meg. Oh, dear. Now, there's going to be a whole bunch of these channels. In fact, 30 of them. That's 720 meg. 720 divided by half means there are 1,400 weights times the number, which is attenuation of dB divided by 20. That means this filter has 3,600 taps. You round it off to 3,700 because I design filters with sloping transition bandwidth. So you want to build a filter with 3,720 taps split into 30 channels. That's sort of like 120 taps per channel or per path. You know you're in trouble. You don't want to do that. But you can do it. We know how to build a filter which will meet those specs. But when you build your polyphase filter, every one of those polyphase arms has 124 taps. So you design the filter. Here's your in-band ripple. Here's your out-of-band ripple. Here's your transition bandwidth. I designed something like this for a customer once, and I can't tell you what the specs were for the customer. That's sort of company private. So I made up a make-believe example with equally as annoying uh, specifications. And that's what I put into the filter to show that given a bad set of specs, you can reduce the cost by being clever with your polyphase filter. So uh, we're going to do that. So the first thing is we know that this particular channelizer had the problem that all the channels that look like this. The ordinary polyphase filter looked like that. And how do you make this filter look like that filter? You move the spectrum sideways. You do an input heterodyne. So this little edge moves to zero instead of being um, the center of the band at zero. So the first thing you do is do terrible things. You do an IQ down converter at the very high sample rate, 720 meg. You're not going to want to do that. But let's make believe we will get around that somehow. Well, the other way is you put the phase rotators in the filter. Instead of having your low pass filter be a low pass filter centered at DC, you can center them at the half sample rate of the channel. But you're still doing the heterodyne with these complex weights at the input data rate. Every time an input sample arrives, you're doing a complex heterodyne. So you haven't changed whether you do the rotators out here or the rotators here, it's still an expensive way to do it. We want to fix that. Well, we're going to also do something trivial. We're going to raise the sample rate. That is, we know that this sample rate was picked to be about 25 meg. It's going to be a little bit more than 25 meg. Uh, we, uh, we have this number divided by 30, and that would have given us whatever the number is. 12.75 times two. And that meant there wasn't much transition bandwidth here. I would like to have more higher sampler rate so I can build a wider transition. Why do you want a wider transition? Because that's the only way you can get to a low cost filter. So what I'm going to do is rebuild the filter and not deliver 30 inputs, but deliver 15 inputs. And instead of doing 30 to one down sampling, I'm going to do 15 to one down sampling. So I've doubled the output sampler rate temporarily. And why would I do that? Well, here's where I've doubled the output sampler rate. That means this is the new folding frequency instead of the folding frequency being here. And that means when I build my channelizer, I can build a way, great big transition. Instead of being a half meg transition, I can be a 12 meg. That's a 24 to 1 increase in transition, which means it's a 24 to 1 decrease in the length of the filter. Now, because uh, we can't see anything, what I did for the demonstration, I pulled them back here a little bit. So I only did a 12 to one increase, but still 12 versus a half is still a 24 to one savings. Okay, so let's see what happens if I now build this wider transition. So instead of being here where I had near 12 and a half is out here near 18 or 19 or 20. So when I built my 30 path filter, 
instead of having 3,000 weights with 124 taps per path, it's now 180 weights with only six taps per path. That's a 20 to one savings. If you can't get an order of magnitude savings, you're not working hard enough yet. Okay, so we did it. We now have a signal, which is now oversampled by, let's say, some factor of two. And now what I'm going to do is build a half-band filter to get rid of the excess bandwidth. And we know how to build half-band filters. So we'll do it. We'll build now a half-band filter, reduce the sample rate by factor of two, which is what we wanted to be when we built the original channelizer. Now, here's a per perfectly good half-band filter. Half-band filters have a neat property that every other sample is zero. If we do the downsampling before the filter, every other sample is zero, so only half the weights are active. Half of these are symmetric, so that means I can do this little trick of folding the filter in half and now do the filtering. So now I can do the filtering on each of the output channels at a very low work rate at a low sampler rate. Remember the trick was lower the bandwidth with the first stage, then build your filter as a second pass. And then you reduce the entire workload because the workload at the low sampler rate is much smaller than the original workload at the high sampler rate. So that's what we did. We built this half band filter cascade and allowed us to build an inexpensive channelizer and push the sampler rate down at the output sampler rate instead of the input sampler rate. Now, here's an interesting trick. Keep on going, I'm doing well, I think. Suppose I have a broadband filter. Remember, this trick of lowering the sampler rate only worked if I had a narrow band filter. What if I have a broadband filter? It still works. That's the amazing thing about this. Here's a broadband signal, and I built a broadband filter which for argument's sake had 600 taps in it, 660 taps. And I could build a filter with 660 taps running at the high input sampler rate. And it would cost me 660 multiplies every time an input point arrived. But instead of doing that, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna build a narrow band filter with the same transition bandwidth and the same sampler rate and the same out of band attenuation. That means this filter has the same number of taps as this filter. And then I'm gonna put this narrow band filter in a polyphase engine. In the polyphase engine, I have all these channels alias to baseband. And it didn't cost me much to build all of those at the same time. And then what I can do, I can take a subset of these channels, go into the dual graph and reassemble the broadband channel as a weighted sum of the narrow band channels leaving out the ones I didn't use, I didn't need to synthesize that bandwidth. Now, if I do this, I argue there will be at least a 10 to one reduction in the workload. So let's exa examine how this happens. What I'm going to do is take my 600 tap, 660 tap filter and put them in a 60 path filter. So this 60 path filter has 11 taps on each arm. Since I'm going to do this little trick where I'm going to double the alpha sample rate, I'm going to put samples here. Those samples are also going to be here later on. Cost me 11 multiplies and adds here, 11 multiplies and adds. Cost me 22 multiplies and adds for each input point as I enter the filter. When I leave the filter in the duo, it's 11 and 11, so it's another 22. So it's 22 on the input, 22 on the output. We're up to 44 operations. Now we have to do is do two 60.48 transforms. It works that I pick 60 because 60 is not a power of two. In fact, 60 is a product of small primes. What are they? Three, four, five. I can do a three point transform, a four point transform, a five point transform. Those would be done with a good time as transform with no polyphase rotate, no rotators as they are in a good, in a, a Kulituki transform. I can do a 60 point transform with 200 real multiplies, even though the data is complex. That's okay. Now, if I take my 200 operations and amortize it over the 15 inputs, amortize supposed to be over 15 inputs. Um, oh, 
I only, yeah, I have to do this over every 15 inputs. But I may have got this number wrong. This may be the number 13. So there are 13 operations per input point to build the transform. There are 13 operations uh, for the output to build the transform. So what's the workload? It's 22, 22, 13, and 13. What does that work out to be? Works out to be, I'm going to add 13 to this, so 70 operations. Okay, 70 operations. Let's compare that to 660. 660 versus 70, it's almost a 10 to 1 savings. Darn. Okay, that's about an 11% workload reduction. So my 660 operations are now being done with 70 operations. And we can do that because we have the ability to take a broadband signal, break it into a bunch of narrowband signals, do the narrowband signals, and generate the narrowband system at the low data rate. It's the low data rate that saves your butt. So now what I'm going to do is this. Instead of doing the little task we did before, where it said, what I want to do is build a half-band filter, where, and we can do that with a half-band filter, I could break this into a whole bunch of narrowband channels, leave these out, leave these out, and get a two-to-one reduction in sampler rate using another polyphase filter. So let's see how much savings that gives us. So we're going to do that fancy little trick I just described. So we do this filter, leave out the ones we don't want. And if we do that using the example of a 30-path filter, it costs us 34 multiplies between input and output to do the two-to-one downsampling. Now, since we've done the two-to-one downsampling, we can also do a two-to-one reduction in bandwidth. That means this filter doesn't have to be the same length of that filter. So we can cut the bandwidth in half because we cut the sampler rate in half. So now we're down to 25 multiplies and adds to do the two-to-one downsampling at the low sampler rate of every one of the channelizers that came out of the first channel. We're not going to worry about this anymore. That's as much as we want to do to inform you this can be done. But this is what we did. We built a 20-path filter. These are all the channels. We only picked the ones which were in band, threw away the ones that are out of band, and we finally got the system working where nobody worked with a big filter at the high sampler rate. And we, when we got to narrow band transitions, we only worked with them on the, um, at the low sampler rate. Now I'm going to spend 10 more minutes. I apologize for the time. This is our empath filter. But here's the case where we did a two to one downsampling that instead of doing M to one downsampling, we did M over two to one. So we doubled the output sample rate so we get a wide transition bandwidth. Now, our Fourier transform that follows the uh, polyphase filter doesn't know whether it's an even index or an odd index set of, of channels. And now these are the odd, these are the even index, zero, two, four. These are the odd indexes, one, three, five. And we noticed that was an expense we didn't want to incur. So let's be clever. If we only have bins that are on the even indexes, zero, plus or minus two, plus or minus four, when I synthesize a what I call a super channel from the narrow band channels, I can go one, three, five, but I can't do one, two, four. But I can if I could do this. I can do if they were the odd symmetric or odd symmetric around the origin, I can get two, I get three from the last one, here's four, I get five from the previous one, here's five. So if we can get this for free, that would be a useful trick. Can we get it for three? This is what we used to do when we knew we couldn't get it for free. We shifted the spectrum sideways, and that was expensive because they were heterodynes at the high sampler rate. If this was a gigahertz sampler rate, you'd be spending a lot of time nudging the spectrum over. And they say, well, let's put the rotators here. It doesn't matter if it's the same thing. It's still data on each path that's being despun. Well, here's a neat little trick. The even index data points happen to be coinciding with the, root, the roots of z to the n minus 1. 
the odd index data points are the roots of z to the n plus one. Isn't that weird? Note that the roots of unity are equally spaced around the unit circle. This guy's symmetric around DC. He's symmetric around the half sample rate. If I combine these two, interesting, when I combine the two, I get all these roots in the same polynomial, z to the 2n minus 1. So I can build a double length transform and then use every other bin for the even set or every other bin for the odd set. And the same transform will do both at the same time. So here are the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if I only use the even bins, here the, I get one set. If I only use the odd bins, I get the other set. So I can build a polyphase filter where the bins are closer together than the space between the channels. And I can skip using the bins, take every other one. And if I do that, we have in the same system the ability to get in the same receiver all the even index bins or all the odd index bins without the phase rotators. Neat little trick, but we can do better than that. Let's do a transform that's not an even number of points. Here's a 16-point transform, and these are the roots of a 16-point transform. What I could do is I can heterodyne DC to the half sample rate. If I do that, I find another zero of the roots of Z to the N minus one. Darn. But let's do this now with a 15-point transform. A 15-point transform, when I heterodyne DC to the half sampler rate, DC is now in between two bins. And that's the condition we wanted when we wanted the odd index Fourier transform bins. So that means instead of heterodyning the spectrum halfway between DC and the first channel, I can heterodyne all the way out to the half sample rate if I have an odd number of points in the DFT. And if I do that, the heterodyne of plus or minus one isn't really a multiply. It still does work at the high sample rate. We can do something about that. But now I don't have to worry. Out of the same transform, I get the even index or the odd index, whether I heterodyne to the half sample rate or not. But we can do better than that. We could put the rotators alternating signs, and that does the first case, move DC to the half sample rate. But this is my 15-point uh, uh, addressing of data into the polyphase filter. And I notice they're plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, because they're alternating signs. And then the next sample of 15, they were plus, minus, plus, minus. Now they're minus, plus, minus, plus. Darn, I can't put these uh, sign changes in the filter because they have to change on alternate sets of 15. But watch this little trick. We don't have to deliver M inputs. We can deliver a smaller number. So let's deliver 12 inputs instead of 15 inputs. 12 is an even number. So let's do that. Oh, here I'm putting 10 in. So I'm putting 10 in. And notice when I put the 10 in and I watch the sign of the data because I've been reversing the sign of the data. Then this guy slides down here and I put the next 10 in. And notice when I put the next 10 in, the data has the same sign as the had the first 10 and the second 10. It means I don't have to put the signs on the data. I can put the signs on the coefficients. And if I put the signs on the coefficients, that's the trick we didn't want to do before because it was expensive. But these are sign changes, and sign changes don't cost us anything. That means if I put the sign changes in here, I have the data where I'm taking the odd indexes out of the transform. If I don't put the sign changes in here, then I have a transform where I'm getting the even index. I can get both out of the same transform. So here's an example I did for a customer showing how it worked. Here, I didn't put the sign changes in into the weights and I got weights symmetric around zero. And when I put the sign changes in, I got the weights offset by half a bin width around zero. Isn't that slick? I didn't change anything except the sign of the coefficients on alternate samples when I loaded them into the polyphase filter. Now, what if I don't have access to an odd number of point transform? I ran into that recently. And I said, well, 
if you don't have access, suppose that when you cut it in half, the number that's half is an odd number. So here I have an 18 point transform. If I take DC and put it up to half sample rate, you're in trouble. You didn't change the problem. But what if I took that data at DC and put it up at the quarter sampler rate? Ding, ding, another winner. Because now I can now rotate the coefficients of the filter with successive powers of J. And if I do that, I get a 90 degree rotation of the spectrum. And I can now still get the odd index frequency bins when I had an even point transform, if the even point transform divided by two is an odd number. So that's a neat little trick. You can do these clever things. Time for an advertisement. The advertisement is Bernie and I have done an interesting thing. We put out the third edition of his book. I'm second author. This was released in, in January. My book, second edition, will be released on the 15th of March, two weeks and counting. And this is what this cover looks like. This book went out of print about eight years ago. And it went out of print, it suddenly became very valuable. Incidentally, look for these, they might be of interest to you. They're certainly of interest to me. But let me show you the first edition of this book. Cover of first edition, I did this two days ago. I went on Amazon. I said, what are the used copies of my first edition going for? And I just copied this price list from the Amazon. The lowest price I could find for the used edition was $800. And they had audacity to charge you a $4 delivery free for a book they're going to sell you for $800. It's even worse. The most expensive one was $1,300 for this book. And they too had the audacity to charge you a $4 delivery charge when they take a book that sold for $110 and raise the price by a factor of 10. Had I known my books could go for that price, I would have bought boxes of them and put them in the garage. And then I wouldn't have to go to work. I could sell books out of my garage the same way Amazon started. Okay. Now, normally I would be closing the presentation here. And this is my Gary Larson cartoon it says, Professor Harris may be excused, my brain is full. I would normally quit now, but I'm going to just do one other thing. I want to show you the magic of, a, of what we can do. So I'm going to have six slides, and then we'll call it quits. Sitting over Japan is a geosynchronous satellite launching 384 MP3 channels. That's 192 stereo channels. And they demodulate all those 192 stereo channels, remodulate them on FM subcarriers, and put them in a broadband FM modulated stream into what they call multiple dwelling units, MDUs. Thousands and thousands of them all over Japan. That group of people have a room in each of these multiple dwelling units. These are six foot high, 19 inches wide. I think there were 13 of them in this rack, 13 in this rack, and there's another 13 around the other side. And this is what it looks like in every one of these. So they said these were made out of non, on DSP, non discretes That is lots of integrated circuits, which were very, very simple instead of being very complex. And each of these boards is one of the 192 trans multiplexes taking the MP3 and converting them to OF, OFDM and sorry, into uh, FDM, frequency division multiplexing, and putting them in a channelizer and pumping them into multiple dwelling units. And this is the guy who came to me. He's one of the guys I know from Qualcomm days. And the dialogue went like this between his customer and me. And they said, how big a room will it take to make the DSP version of that room? Now, they're doing that because they couldn't get parts anymore for the parts that were failing. And when I saw the specs, I said, I think it'll fit in a single chip. Their response was, don't be absurd. You can't pack that room into a single chip. And they wouldn't fund us. And I said, if I can fund that into a fail, if I can put one of your boards into a single chip, will you fund me? They said, we'll consider it. And I said, well, I did it. They said, no, that's not enough. Put 10 of them in a single chip. 
and I put 10. I said, I can put all 190 in a single chip and I won't use up the single chip. So they funded us and this is what we eventually did for this customer. We packed that room we just saw into this little box, which is two U high. That means a three and a half inches high. It's 17 inches wide and nine inches deep. That box and this room do the same thing. And we got a chance to write a paper using Xilinx webpage. And here is me and Dragon Volatech, very bright young former student and Wade Loudermilk, a similarly very bright. Now they're a little bit older as I am a little bit older. And we described what went into that design. Uh, about six months after we got this publication, Xilinx sent us the Chinese version of the same publication. And my Chinese students said they did a pretty good job converting this into that, except certain words don't translate well into Chinese. Our names are some of them. So that was one set of magic. This is what I did for Xilinx. This is the last one. There's a new standard called DOCSIS 3. Cable TV has done away with six megahertz and eight megahertz channels in Europe, and now it uses OFDM, and the OFDM super channels are 95 megahertz wide, and there are six of them above the positive frequency and six negative frequency. So when you build this whole system, this system runs at about 1.7 gig sampler rate, and it contains six of these channels on the positive frequency axis. With an impressive set of specs, the set of specs you don't want to see because at this very high sample rate, let's go back to a low sample rate, only 200 meg. This is a half meg transition bandwidth. So if you take 200 meg and divide by uh, the half, that's 400 times 80 divided by 20, that's times four. So this works have to be a 1400 tap filter. And there are two of them, one for I and one for Q. So the question is, can you, and Chris Dick gave me this, said, Fred, use your magic and make this 20 hundred tap filter, not be a 2800 tap filter. We knew we could build it. We could build a 2800 tap filter, one I, one Q, which meets the specs, meets the in-band ripple, meets the out-of-band ripple, duck soup. But then we could build a polyphase filter bank. And the polyphase filter bank has an interesting problem. The interesting problem is, we're going to build a bunch of narrow band channels, and there's no guarantee that the narrow band channels coincide with this width. So that means we may have one channel which brackets this. And if we bracket it, we can be fatter than the design goal or skinnier than the design goal, but we can't meet the design goal. Not a problem. What happens, we can build a channelizer, and the two end channels, the one on the far left, the one on the far right, will go through his own little channel. And that little channel will reduce the bend band edges to the band that we want. So we have a band ed filter to give us a bunch of narrow bands. And we have another band which takes the two bands at the end and reduces their bandwidth. We knew that was the right way to do. It. We've done that two or three times now. So let's see what we got out of this. So this is the channelizer we built, which was a 30 path filter. And notice, it was smack in the middle of this band that we need. So what we did is say, well, we'll build this little filter. And this little filter will take this bandage and reduce the bandwidth down to what we want. And we'll see what the workload is. When you build this entire workload, which contains the 30 path filter in front and contains this little, little bitty filter on the left and a little bitty filter on the right, we can build this entire chain with 103 multiplies between the input and output. And 103 versus 2,800 is a 28 to one reduction of work. I don't think anyone is building uh, DOCSIS 3 uh, uh, receivers that don't use this design I did for Chris Dick. Now, if you really want to reduce the workload, what you do is that little filter we built inside you can always build a filter more efficiently if you make them a polyphase filter. And this little polyphase filter was an inner tier filter and an outer tier filter. And when you did that, it went from 128 to 104. So you still get worth workload reduction, 
So this is the ripple you got from the outer filter. And this is the ripple you got from the inner filter. And we converted 2,800 multiplies and adds to 104 real multiplies and adds. And I think we're just about finished. Do, but is it true that DSP makes the world go round, but multi-rate signal processes supplies the music for the ride? There can be no doubt at all. And here comes the closing slide. My closing slide. I was once chairman of the Software Defined Radio Conference, and this was my closing slide. And if you look very carefully at it, you know he has a remarkable similarity to the face that you saw and still see in the upper left-hand corner. And that's it. And I will now stop sharing. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you very okay. much. So that was a hint that we can do applied magic. You can take problems which are in, in, incapable of being done, even if you if money is no or well if money is no constraint, you can do bulk, you can do brute force. But brute force isn't the way to solve the problem. We can take big problems and make little problems out of them by following the cardinal rule: always do your filter at the lowest sample rate you can. Mm -hmm. And if you want to make the filter short, allow them to have a wider transition bandwidth. Do it in two stages. Have a wide transition for the input filter and then build your narrow transitions at the low sample rate at the output of the first filter. Dynamite combination. You can convince your, your employer when you solve problems this way that it, when you're not at work, you can also walk on water because it does look like applied magic. I'm open for questions. Anyone okay. have anything? Yeah, I guess before we go to questions, I know it's a little bit late. Um, so I'd like to see, you know, just want to thank you um, again for being an outstanding speaker. Uh, it's amazing how much I learned through this uh, presentation. Yeah, there's so much magic involved in uh, DSP. And it is magic. How, yeah, how efficient you can get uh, you, know, you can apply the right technique to make things much more efficient, reducing the complexity of 100 fold. That cascade of multi rate yeah. filters can do an amazing number of things for you. Right. Right. So, I'm, not, yeah, I'm so, not doing that for a number of satellite providers because they have a problem. How do you get the heat off the bird? Don't generate the heat, and you won't have to get it off the bird. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So, um, I guess, Darren, do you want to do the q and A? I I guess I'm not seeing the questions actually on my side. I'm not sure what's... Uh... Okay, I think I need to click on them to make them visible. So, okay. Okay. if you want, uh, you might see a couple now. Okay. Okay, let's see. I hope. If not, I can read them. Okay, thank you. Why don't I just read it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good idea. Uh, uh, since the system is using a lot of aliasing to downconvert, does that mean at a high frequency, say greater than 10 gigahertz, you can still use cheaper, relatively slow FPGAs? What is the relationship between signal speed and DSP speed? And is it entirely based on the fractional bandwidth of the desired signal? It's not dependent upon the fractional bandwidth because that's what the polyphase filter did. It took a broadband signal and made narrowband. We did a design for a group at Office of Navy Research that has a woman there building 30 gigahertz A to D converters. They're one bit sigma delta converters and they happen to be uh, cryogenic, which means amazingly deep noise floor and a one gig useful bandwidth with a noise floor way, way down under normal thermal noise. And we built polyphase filter banks and took the signals down to 15 kilohertz bandwidth in a gigahertz initial bandwidth for her. So that, that's the kind of work you can do. Ultimately, what limits you is the aperture uncertainty of the sample and hold in the A to D converter. It's not the converter that's the limiting, but the bandwidth of the A to D hook converter. Because if you have jitter with the clock, the jitter noise comes up and wipes out anything else you have. And I do lots of designs now, compliments to Chris Dick, we're, we're running eight to 10 gigahertz A to D converters and using polyphase filter banks for them. And all these high-speed converters are interleaved converters. 
if you have interleave converters, each interleave converter, once you align out and take out the the timing offset and the imbalance due to all the separate paths, you can feed each of those converters into a polyphase engine directly into it. You don't have to re-establish the interleaving because we're going to de-interleave in the polyphase. So that's an interesting architecture directly from the interleave converters into the polyphase filter, and you don't take any hit in performance. Hey, thank you. Um, anyone has any questions, you can type them in the, in the uh, Q&A box. It should be down at the bottom of your screen, possibly under the dot, 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 more options. Give it a minute here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, is, you know, um, I'm sure there's probably uh, more questions. Is it okay if people uh, contact you? Um, oh, yeah, they can, yeah. Kind of... they can contact me. I think you have my email address. Uh -huh. If you don't, we can say it's it's F J Harris and uh -huh. Frank J John. Why not Fred and Joel? Fred, Fred Joel Harris <laughs> at <laughs> ucsd.edu. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I, I always invite questions because you get real problems from people in the industry. Otherwise, we, we have toy problems when you make them up yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't even want to ask uh, questions to the chat, but um, uh, I do have in depth questions. I'll, I'll email you. But uh, superficial, are, are these? Is this uh, recorded? Can we uh, access this? It was you? recorded, and we can distribute them. Uh, yes, it it was recorded. I I, I missed the first couple slides because oh, I forgot dear. to click okay. record. That's but, uh, <laughs> but it is recorded, and, and it will we will be able to make that available to you. Yeah. And slides slides are available also. Um, I have to do, right now. My slides are PowerPoints. Well, they take up a lot of space. Oh, I, I can see. I can send them to Victor, but first I'll convert them into PDFs so they take up less space. Okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. And I'll okay. leave it Thank you. Uh, I can go ahead and do the unmute thing if anybody is just in case anybody's trying to. Uh, well, I think that looks like Eric was able to unmute himself, so maybe that maybe I don't need to, but. Um, so certainly type anything in the Q and A if you have any questions. And like I said, um, or like Victor said, we can uh, certainly field those by email as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, I have something that I need to uh, get get to, um, so I okay. can't stay much longer. But I really do appreciate. It. I apologize for keeping you past your statute. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I would, uh, Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is worth it. Yeah, just all the amazing tricks that you did. With, uh, it is amazing. <laughs> yeah. When when people ask what's the hardest yeah. part of doing this, it's convincing your employee that it makes sense to do it. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, and I see so many applications for this. So, okay. Well, and, yeah. and you can certainly contact me directly. <laughs> I do a lot of consulting offline. A lot of development work. Yes, yes. Okay, and uh, people can pick up your new book as well. You know that's and, right. Yep. In, yep. in fact, mm -hmm. some of the things in the new book were put in about a week before I submitted the final <laughs> uh, manuscript because I was developing them in real time while I was putting the book together. Okay. And just for fun. We, uh, the, the workload I'm covering in the book where I have gigahertz sample rates at the high end, I have other sample rates where the bandwidths are tens of hertz, which are hearing aid uh, polyphase filter rates. And you can build a whole bank of polyphase hearing aid filters, which have minimum time delay. They don't have to be linear phase and they don't have to be um, linear phase fur filters. They can be non-uniform phase fur filters as well as recursive. There's no limitation on how you can apply these polyphase parts. I apologize. I learning a bit here. I need to scroll down a bit to look at the questions. There were there aren't any actually any questions. There are just a couple of comments that uh, 
Sean mentioned, uh, you know, great presentation. He's looking forward to being able to uh, get the e get the email out and uh, hoping that you know for the the next edition of the the uh, book. And uh, Alex Revnik said uh, also he liked the graphic on slide thirty nine. <laughs> what was the slide? I uh, it was. Uh, I don't know, but it says as an analog engineer, I uh, never thought of Fourier space that way. Oh, okay. Slide thirty-nine. I've got to look. <laughs> it, had, it, had to, it, it must have been something about uh, Fourier spaces for uh, for analog engineers. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if it's okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I, I think I can get going, and I, uh, I just want to thank everybody for participating and uh but people want to stay on a little bit longer i'm not sure if darren wants to stay on for other people to continue to chat over oh, uh, I, I just saw slide 39. i have a whole series of slides oh one of the things you want to worry about stop using cooley tukey algorithms and your channelizers the power goes way way down almost an order of magnitude if you use good thomas uh, winograd transforms you don't get uh, twiddle factors and your workload goes down significantly. So bear that in mind. Thank you. Um, I, I don't, I don't uh, uh, see any other questions coming in. So, okay. Um, okay. Well, well, I thank everyone who attended. Um, and I, I hope I didn't inconvenience anyone. And it's uh, fun to interact with people to share this knowledge. Um, yes and uh be willing to share it with everyone great and, and great. contact me for more i can i can send stacks of papers if anyone wants a specific uh, uh or at least i can point you to the paper right if you want specific in inputs yeah. thank you again so much for your service uh dr harris okay uh, to thank you meeting. victor yeah. all right thank you. okay thank you everybody for joining in today to see you guys okay next thanks time. okay thanks all. okay take care bye-bye